1 Samuel, and we'll be in uh, chapter 2 as well as chapter 21. <clears throat> If you found chapter 2, please turn and look down to verse 27. That's where we'll begin reading tonight. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honors thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel my people? Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come, and I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thy house, thine house. And uh, we'll pray there. Father, I just ask that this evening that you would help us as we look at this promise that you made to Eli, and we look at it fulfilled, God, to see that you are a God who keeps His Word, and a God who takes serious the matters of holiness. And Lord, we also know you to be a God who's merciful and who loves sinners. And so help us to be able to discern what provokes you, so that, God, we could be warned, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever wonder sometimes when you read the Scripture at the harshness and finality of God's wrath and judgment in some instances in contrast with His long-suffering and mercy in other instances? Sometimes I look at what God says and I think, wow, boy, that is... I mean, that's, that's what they deserved and they are getting what they deserved. Now, I don't think I've ever looked at God's judgment on a person and thought, well, they didn't deserve that. There's not an instance of that. There have been many times though I've looked at individuals and thought they deserve worse than that. And I certainly that would be true of me any time I say it, if I'm honest about it. Any time that I have transgressed against the Lord, when I acknowledge my transgression, my response is, well, God... If the roles were reversed here, I'd be through. That's it. You know, I've had people try to play the whole, you know, sin and, uh, you know, sinning in ignorance and sinning willfully game with me before. And, you know, for a Christian who's grown in the faith and knows the Word of God, there just isn't much ignorance in sin. Last time you lost your temper, you knew what you were doing before you did it. You knew what you were doing while you did it. And it is what it was. Uh, the last time, the last time you allowed lust to go to the place that it conceived and became sin, probably wasn't because you didn't know any better. Isn't it true if we're honest about it? It's just true. And... Um, God's pretty merciful with us. Pretty merciful? Yes, sir. That's the understatement, isn't it? The fact is, is God is rich in mercy. He's very long-suffering. Not only is He not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, He offers for us the work of the cross in its entirety for the life of a believer so that when a believer sins... If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And so, God's very merciful. 
He's more merciful to me than he ought to be. That's a fact. Sometimes I look at the Scripture and I see God with harshness and finality judging. Many believers, don't they, struggle with the whole idea of a generational curse? Believers look at when someone who is part of a household seems to inherit God's judgment. And this certainly would seem to be a case of that. We know that in the prophets, particularly Ezekiel and Jeremiah, that the elders of Israel were expressly commanded to scrap an old saying. Remember the old say, saying, the foxes or the fathers have eaten sour grapes and their children's teeth are set on edge. And God said, As I live, ye shall not have cause to say this anymore. And God said, Stop saying that. The children are going to be judged for their sins and the fathers are going to be judged for their sins. Certainly is truth, though, that the Bible teaches. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And it certainly is true that uh, children very, very naturally inherit the sins of their fathers. Just in their nature, they're sinners already, but we just learn about sin. You ever wish you didn't even know about some sins? I mean, you just wouldn't even struggle with it if you didn't know about it. It's why it's wise for believers to be simple concerning evil. Sometimes we think, oh, we've got to educate ourselves and know all about the ins and outs of the thing. My friend, you will teach your flesh about it and then it'll foster a desire. So it's wise for us to protect ourselves from even the knowledge of sin. That being said, we've got a flesh that wants to know things, wants to sin. We begin our study in Judges really with, or in Samuel I should say, with Eli and looking at the transition between the periods of the Judges and the Kings. And we saw early on this indictment that God had against Eli because he didn't restrain his sons. Remember what he said? That's bad what you guys are doing. But the Bible says about him that he didn't stop his sons. There's a difference between saying, guys, I don't agree with that, and saying, stop that. You know, we have our saying right now in law enforcement, see something? Yeah. I have one that's better than that as an American citizen who believes in some things that are inherent in uh, life and liberty and pursuit of happiness. See something, do something. That's what I believe. But wait... You know, we, we take the whole courage element out, so now it's see something, say something, run away and tell somebody. You know. <laughs> uh, that was Eli. Guys, yeah, this is not good. I don't agree with this at all. It's not. No. He should have restrained his sons. Consequently, God rejected, really rejected him in much the same way that Saul was rejected, but we see. Samuel's sons kind of went down the same route. We ended up with the children of Israel using that for justification for wanting a king instead of a judge and a priest. And we saw the progression of King Saul. We saw that good people go bad. Good people can change for worse. and Bad people can change for better. And really, that's Saul and David in contrast because save it, David, save it. That's my mixture for the two guys when I'm tired. Saul and David is saved. Okay. I make up words and don't want to. All right. uh, but Saul and David, in contrast, you know, Saul started out really great. David started out really well. But when you look at their sins, if I'm the judge, I don't like David very much as a father and a husband, do you? Just don't, I don't have... Uh, I have no compunction to tell you to study David to learn how to parent. Or study David to learn how to be a husband. Or study David to know what to look for in a man. Right? Actually, I'd take Saul for a father and a husband over David. 
because I don't know that much about Saul as a father and husband. Saul's at a place now where we're seeing the transition. God has not only rejected his seed from being established forever, but God has personally rejected Saul from being king. And Saul's rebellion, instead of being humbled, he has increased his rebellion against God. He has, uh, if you will, amped it up. He's worse than what he was. So now, so now he is pursuing David. Jonathan, David's dear friend, Saul's son, who has been rejected from sitting on the throne. Jonathan is David's friend. He's loyal to David. He's realized the evil that's in the heart of his father. And now David is fleeing for his life, running for his life. And that's where we pick up in chapter 21 of 1 Samuel. Verse 1 of chapter 21, Then came David to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and then Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David, and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said unto him, Like the priest, the king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything in the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my service to such and such a place. And that was dishonest on David's part. Mm -hmm. uh, David asked him for bread, for a weapon. He ended up getting showbread and, and uh, Goliath's sword. Verse 7, Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. Notice that phrase. I don't think I've noticed it before. I haven't paid special attention to it. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day. Notice that phrase. Detained before the Lord. Who was responsible for Doeg being there? Wasn't really a great good man, actually, as we see later. I don't think he was there because he cared about spiritual things and he tended to hang out in a spiritual place. I believe that he was there because the Lord wanted him to be there. He was a wicked man who was an instrument in the hand of a holy God. So the Bible says Edomite, he was an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. Now you say, oh, this is bad. He's loyal to Saul. Well, so is David. Right? David's also loyal to Saul. And anyone who knew David, including Saul's son Jonathan, knew David was loyal to King Saul. David had been anointed king of Israel. I don't know how much the word of that got out, but Samuel is no longer on the scene and certainly would be apparent that Samuel probably would have made it known after the deed was done that David is king of Israel. People knew David was God's anointed. But David was loyal to King Saul and he wouldn't touch Saul because Saul was also God's anointed. And so this man Dog was willing to do what no one else was willing to do and that is to try to betray innocent blood. That is David. Long story short, Saul finds out that David is gone and he is trying to kill David and he offers a reward, offers a reward to anyone that would betray David and no one does except this fellow Doeg speaks up. And in verse 9 of chapter 22, if you'll look forward, Saul's accusing everyone of betrayal. Verse 9, Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was said of the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech the son of Ahitub. And he inquired the Lord for him, and gave him victuals, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came all them to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. 
And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day? Ahimelech's answer here is classic innocence. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house? Ahimelech said, Is it a problem to help your more, most loyal servant and son-in-law who is submissive to you and is for your cause. He's honorable in thy house. He said, Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. Notice what he did say, though, here. He said, Nor to all the house of my father. And if we're tracing genealogies, he goes back to Eli. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the truth is that if we go back, let's just read it one more time, verse 21. The Bible says in verse 1, chapter 21, verse 1, Then came David to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David, and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business. And has said unto me, Let no man know anything in the business whereof, whereas, and so was Ahimelech telling the truth? The answer is yes, he was. Second question Was Ahimelech innocent of conspiring against the king? It's not a trick question. He was perfectly innocent, wasn't he? He didn't do anything wrong. So here's the king's response, and we're almost finished tonight. <clears throat> and the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled, and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. I don't know how these guys survived, to be frank. But they were courageous men, weren't they? One of the things I like about Saul, he was surrounded by courageous men. There's no more courageous man than his son Jonathan. And I believe that he came by it pretty honestly because Saul, before, before he became great in his own eyes, Saul was a courageous man. A man of great courage, a good man. But now look how far Saul has gone. He's gone from the place of having his seed being rejected from sitting on the throne and not being willing to accept it. Further to being rejected himself from sitting on the throne and not being willing to accept it. To now being willing to commit murder of David to try to supplant his sitting on the throne. And Jonathan wasn't willing to be part of that conspiracy. If anyone could have killed David, Jonathan could have done it in trust and confidence, couldn't he? Could have betrayed his friend. Now I'm saying humanly speaking. Jonathan wouldn't do it. And Saul's footmen wouldn't, they would not do wrong. They wouldn't attack these servants of the Lord. Even though Saul commanded them. And I think it was a matter of they, they, their thought, their, their response was, I'd rather die than do evil. But there was a guy that was detained by the Lord. You remember him? Verse 18, the king said to Doeg, Turn now, fall upon the priest. Doeg the Edomite turned and fell on the priest and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Eighty-five priests by himself. Doeg murdered. You know, there are a lot of instances of exploits of men who had great courage and were filled with God's power going out and fighting in the battle and slaying many men of war. But my friend, this is not courageous to fall on the priests, the servants of God. It's not courage. 
The Bible says in 19, verse 19, Nob the city of the priests smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Kind of did the job that Saul was supposed to do with the Amalekites. Except he did it with the Levites. One of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day, when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Boy, that is a that's a load, isn't it? Can you imagine being David? Just thinking, oh, I knew when Doeg saw us. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. So, let's armchair quarterback this one. Shall we? There's Doeg. He's an Edomite, so he's not really a <clears throat> real Israelite. He saw me. I'll just kill him. Do you kill a man that hasn't done anything? Because he was in the presence of the priest that day? Is that a good solution? David would be a murderer, wouldn't he? <clears throat> Should have never gone there. David wanted to inquire of the Lord. Where did he go to inquire of the Lord in those days? You go to the tabernacle. Not, not a temper, temple yet. It's a little bit of a trick question. You go to the tabernacle, don't you? Give me a scenario where David could have done something different and where Abiathar and, uh, I'm sorry, and Ahimelech and the other priests could have been spared. <coughs> Got one, Lee? They could have not have lied. I don't know if that would have changed. <coughs> David could not have lied? Could have not lied? Yeah. Well, if in that situation, allowing that, Abiathar would have had the, I mean, Ahimelech would have had the obligation to go to Saul. The Arkansans have a say, saying, you always lie to strangers. You always lie to, I thought you said there are Kansans, but you said Arkansans. So I was almost a Arkansans. Yeah, I was about to make a Texas rebuttal there. So <laughs> we're, we're okay. You always lie to strangers. Yeah. <laughs> I knew there's something about them, Arkansans. I'll buy a third one in the string. One in the string, yeah. Okay. David said, I knew when I saw him. So, you know, you could go through those scenarios. You could say, well, David shouldn't have lied. It's the only thing that I can come up with. Would have made things different. But you know what? It all comes back to why was Doeg there? Why was he there? We see his character pretty well, don't we, by this time? He wasn't there because he was fond of the priests. Could we could we agree on that? He wasn't there because, well, you know, I just like I just like the priests. Now he'd like seem like to kill him, but he wasn't there because of good character, was he? Why was he there? What? <laughs> well, but we, but we have the answer in our original text. Why was he there? Because God wanted him to be. He was detained to the Lord. He was detained to the Lord, the Bible says. In other words, God had it happen. He was there because of a promise that God made to Eli. God has a way of using wicked people to sometimes carry out a vengeance that a righteous man wouldn't just wouldn't be able to do. 
And it's not because God has a way of doing evil. It's because God is absolutely in every way always in control. And God's able to take evil and use it. There's one last question we need to ask, though. What of the sucklings, the babies? What of the women, the wives? What of the children? What of the priest like Ahimelech, who is a lot better guy than Eli's sons? You may not like this, but it'll help you with reality in life, and that is that every man who's ever lived under the curse of sin has been immortal. And the number of days that we live on this earth and the way that we die in the matter and scope of an eternity when there's a good God in heaven to be with for eternity makes it so that the way we die is rather insignificant. If I were to ask this evening for you to be able to choose the way that you want to die, most people here well, no, we might not agree. A lot of people would like to just die peacefully in their sleep, right? That's like the sought-after way of dying. Some people want to go, you know, go out guns blazing, you know, <laughs> sort of fiery crash or something. Make my day. <laughs> right? Uh, some people want to go philosophically. Most people don't like the way they have to die. Some people, by the grace of God, die graciously. And others die the opposite way. But death's a certain thing. And I'll be quite honest with you, if I'm Jonathan, I'm going to go the way Jonathan went. Right? Die on the battlefield. Fighting for the cause. And if I'm a Hemelech, I'm going to die the way Hemelech died. Die with the linen ephod on. And say the truth. You don't have a more loyal subject than David. And I did right. You see, God didn't judge a Hemelech for Eli's sin. But God did fulfill a prophecy about Eli. And Ahimelech was part of it. You know, if you're a Gentile, there's prophecy about Gentiles. And God's going to fulfill prophecy about Gentiles. If you're Jewish, there's prophecy about Jews. And God's going to fulfill prophecy about Jews and Gentiles. And friend, it would help us a whole lot to realize that God's got a big plan. And whatever part our, our role is in God's plan, God's good. And you know, these guys are all right, aren't they? Ahimelech's all right, isn't he? Jonathan's all right. Doeg isn't. And aren't you glad God used Doeg instead of a good man? God's amazing, isn't he? Isn't it incredible how God works and how he's able to take evil and use it to work his good plan? You know, Eli. Eli needed that prophecy. It needed to stop. It needed to end. God was right about that. You know, I don't rejoice to see any wicked person come into place of judgment. But it needs to happen. And God's good all the time. Father, thank You for what we learned this evening. Please help us to absorb and retain. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.